This is Endocrine Feedback Loop. I am your host, Chase Hendrickson, and welcome you to this Journal Club podcast series brought to you by Endocrine Society. Thanks for joining us as we explore an important article recently published in one of the Society's clinical journals. Hello and welcome back to the Endocrine Feedback Loop podcast for our 41st episode. Today, we look at a study that investigates whether adding data to the well-known FRAX calculator might improve its ability to predict future osteoporotic fracture risk. As is typically the case for us with this podcast, the authors here use an observational study design. Such designs come with intrinsic limitations, which we will think about and discuss how they apply to this article. We will spend some time thinking through the author's conclusions and we'll end with trying to decide if our clinical practice to change based on these results. Before I introduce the rest of the team today, I will briefly remind you that I host the Endocrine Feedback Loop, working at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center as a general endocrinologist and medical director. Recurring today as a regular contributor is our resident bonehead, Amal Shibley Rahal from the University of Iowa. She is a master educator in endocrinology, currently serving as an associate dean for the Carver College of Medicine and as the lead endocrine educator for the internal medicine residency there, having also been the fellowship director in the recent past. Her clinical practice does focus on bone and calcium disorders with numerous publications in this field and in endocrinology in general. Our guest expert today comes from the Mayo Clinic. John Sphere is known to you all for his work on musculoskeletal cellular senescence. At the Mayo, his clinical practice centers on the naturally overlapping fields of osteoporosis and geriatrics, in addition to other aspects of bone and mineral metabolism. So, as usual, the perfect pair of endocrinologists joins me to help us understand an article about fracture risk. As is also always the case, everything we discuss is our opinions only and not those of our respective institutions or or of the Endocrine Society. For this month's podcast episode, we review hemoglobin levels improve fracture risk prediction in addition to FRAX clinical risk factors and bone mineral density, which is a forthcoming article in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. Raju Jaiswal from the University of Gothenburg served as the first author for this paper with other authors coming from several centers in Sweden and the UK. Now, Amal will take things over. She will walk through the main points that these authors make in their introduction. Along with Yad, she will also help us understand some of the background of the FRAX and the pathophysiology of osteoporosis so that we can better understand the author's investigation and their conclusions. Amal? Thank you for this kind introduction, Chase. For this study, as Chase mentioned, it looks at uh, the correlation between hemoglobin and the ability to predict risk fracture, particularly in older women. Previous studies have shown an association between anemia and bone density, as well as an increased risk of fracture associated with anemia. The mechanism of this association is not clear yet. However, anemia has also been associated with a higher risk of sarcopenia and of a higher risk of falls. So I will stop for a little bit here and ask Jad what he thinks about the potential mechanistic explanation for these associations, and Jad, particularly with your background related to uh, cellular senescence. Yes, thanks for having me here. Uh, As you said, the mechanism is not very clear when it correlates to hemoglobin or anemia in general with uh, decreased bone density, possibly increased risk of fracture. There are a number of hypotheses that have been previously suggested. One such hypothesis is that anemia causes increased osteoclastic activity and thus increasing bone resorption. Remember that osteoclasts are derived from hematopoietic stem cells and increase and hematopoiesis that can happen in response to anemia, whatever the cause of anemia is, could also stimulate osteoclast production and osteoclast proliferation. Another hypothesis is that the chronic hypoxia that comes from anemia induces oxidative stress, including in the bone microenvironment. This creates an acidic milieu in the extracellular matrix of the bone, which contributes to both increased osteoclastic activity and inhibition of the proliferation and maturation of osteoblasts. This is also supported by the fact that chronic diseases associated with hypoxia, such as COPD, have also been linked to reduced bone density. Very good. This is very helpful. Thank you, Jade. 
Talking a little bit about FRAX, which stands for the Fracture Risk Assessment Tool. It is a well-known tool that uses age, sex, and body mass index together with a number of clinical risk factors to estimate 10-year probabilities of hip and major osteoporotic fractures. The femoral neck bone mineral density can be used as an additional data point in the FRAX calculator, but is not necessary. Back to you, Jad, I will ask you if you can provide us with a high-level overview of how the FRAX calculator was created and how it is used clinically. FRAX was launched in 2008 uh, based on data that had been generated over the prior decade, mostly to fill the gap that has been seen between BMD and fracture risk. It has long been recognized that numerically, the majority of fragility fractures happen in patients who have low bone density, but not necessarily in the range of osteoporosis as defined by a T-score of minus 2.5 or less. Numerically, most of them happen in someone with what is called a as osteopenia on the bone density. And so the FRAX came from this work over decade-long work, mostly done through the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. But since then, the FRAX has become a very important tool to bring together a number of clinical risk factors, as you said, with or without BMD, to predict the 10-year risk of fractures. One big strength of this tool is that it provides country-specific risk based on country-specific fracture data. In fact, many national guidelines, such as Lebanon and up till recently Canada, used the FRAX-based decision to initiate pharmacotherapy for fracture risk reduction. So it is clearly that FRAX has become a very important clinical tool when managing patients with low bone density. I pointed earlier that the FRAX calculator incorporates several different clinical risk factors, such as rheumatoid arthritis, smoking, excessive drinking, prior history of fractures, etc. However, it may not be accounting for all possible risk factors. And this study aims to investigate the potential additional contribution of hemoglobin levels to the predictive ability of FRAX. So the study has several aims. The primary aims are twofold. First, to investigate the association between hemoglobin levels and the risk of incident fracture in older women. And second, we're still talking about the primary aim, to evaluate the contributing effect of hemoglobin levels on 10-year fracture probabilities as calculated by the FRAX tool. So basically asking, would adding hemoglobin to the calculations done by the current FRAX as we have it be of additional benefit or predictive capability? Secondary aims include analyzing the associations between anemia and levels of hemoglobin on the one hand, with variables of BMD bone microstructure that are derived from the DEXA and from the HRPQ-CT. We will talk a little bit more about HRPQ-CT in a little bit, but I would like to invite Chase to jump in and tell us a little bit about the methods of this study. Thanks, Amal and Jod, for walking through the background there. So I think we have a good understanding of what we need to the, the clinical understanding of the FRAX calculator in particular, and that's going to be helpful as we keep that in mind, thinking about the methods. So what we normally do is we're going to think a little bit about the specific study design that's used here, because I think that then really helps us understand how to analyze this article as we go along. I think this is best described as a prospective cohort study, and we're going to think about that in general before we get into the particulars of this investigation. A prospective cohort study, the way that it works, first of all, we'll start with a cohort study, is with a cohort study, you have a, a cohort, a, a group of subjects, and then within that cohort, you have at least two subgroups, and those are defined by the presence or absence of an exposure. Often, you will have multiple subgroups if there is something that, that can be graded, so you can have varying degrees of an exposure, but at a minimum, you have two subgroups within that cohort. What then makes it a cohort study is that you are following those subjects, those individuals over time, looking for the development of an outcome to try to see if having the exposure or not having the exposure makes it more or less likely that you're going to have the outcome or outcomes of interest. What makes it a prospective cohort study is that you are following along in real time with these individuals. So the a retrospective cohort study, the opposite, that study starts after all of the data has been collected and is available. So it's not only after the exposure data is available, but also after the outcome data. 
even with those, you still have to be able to recreate a timeline so that you know that the exposure predated the outcome, but but you're waiting until after all of that data is available in some sort of a database or you are reviewing chart notes, some way that you can collect that data, but it already exists. A prospective cohort study, you start it only after the exposure has occurred. The outcomes have not yet occurred, and then you follow those subjects in real time. A prospective cohort study is often generally considered to be the, the strongest of all the observational study designs. One of the big reasons for that is, is that you can confirm that the outcomes come after the exposure because you are following these folks in real time. The other real strength, and we're going to see that here, is that you get to define exactly what information you want, not only with the exposures, but also with the outcome, because you're beginning at, at the very start. So you can grab whatever information you need, and it's not afterwards, and you're just hoping all the information that you might want is available in that chart review or in that database or whatever it is that you're using. So a very strong study design, and we're going to think about about how the authors use that here. Now, this study, this is part of the Solgrinska University Hospital Prospective Evaluation of Risk of Bone Fracture Study. And if you were able to track that in your head, that is the SUPERB is the acronym for that. This is the SUPERB study. And that is postmenopausal women aged 75 to 80 at baseline who were community dwelling in Gothenburg, Sweden. And the individuals who were invited to participate in this were randomly selected from a population registry between March of 2013 and May of 2016. And they invited over 6,800 individuals and about half, nearly half, a little over 3,000 were included. About 3,400 declined to participate and a few hundred, a little over 400 were excluded. A variety of reasons that the authors had listed as exclusion criteria, not being able to communicate in Swedish, having had bilateral hip replacements, then making the imaging difficult, or if they weren't ambulatory. So those, those are the, that's your cohort there. And then your baseline analysis, and I would encourage you in this exposure outcome way of thinking about things is to think about the baseline analysis of being of the exposures. So there's a few different ways that they collected that information. They use questionnaires and that helped them figure out the clinical risk factors that go into the FRAX calculator. They also asked about a history of falls and a previous use of osteoporosis treatment. A few lab information that they obtained, hemoglobin, as you would guess, because that's that's the focus of this study, also creatinine and albumin. And then finally, for imaging, they at baseline, they collected two types of imaging. So DEXA, something that we're all very familiar with, but another one that we may not be very familiar with. And so that's the high res QTC or quantitative computed tomography. So John, we need your help here. Uh, DEXA, almost anybody who's going to do anything with osteoporosis is really familiar with that, but not a high res QTC. So help us understand that, where that applies, why that is so often used in research study. So just walk us through and give us an understanding of that. Sure. So uh, HRPQCT, most of it is in the name, high resolution peripheral quantitative CT. So it's non-invasive imaging that actually gives you a lot of information regarding the microstructure of the bone. This is where the high resolution comes from. But also it's basically at the peripheral sites, distal uh, radius and distal tibia is where measurements are happening. And it is able to generate volumetric bone density and because uh, it generates three dimensions dimensional structures of the bone, but also is able to separate the two compartments, uh, the cortical and the trabecular compartment of the bone, and gives us granular data about uh, these compartments without high dose radiation or central radiation to the body. It is a very useful tool for evaluating bone quality. It is, like you said, not available clinically, but mostly available in uh, through research protocols, but not widely available across the country or many institutions. On the other hand, DEXA, which would highlight the limitation of DEXA when you use HRPQCT, although it uses central sites, the hip and the spine typically, it provides two-dimensional image of a 3D structure. So it only can give you aerial bone density as opposed to volumetric bone density. But it uses very low dose X-ray, very widely available, very affordable. And like you said, this is something that is routinely used because of its cost effectiveness and evaluating bone strength. Very helpful. So this is all the information that is obtained at the baseline, the exposures. And we'll think here in a second about how that's actually used. 
Now, the other thing to think about is the outcome data. And this is primarily around fracture analysis. And the way that this study did it, and it, and it really relied upon the robust data that is available with the healthcare system in Sweden, is, is when they were looking for the occurrence of, of the outcome of interest of a fracture, is, is that they were able to obtain plain film images and or reports of those images from the medical records or regional archives. And with that, when they were able to identify these incident fractures, they were reviewed by a research nurse and an orthopedic surgeon. And importantly, and this is another area where we're going to get John's input with this, they did not do monitoring. So this entirely relied upon an individual, a patient showing up somewhere and, and getting imaging done, and that imaging then found a fracture. There, there was, was not a regular uh, schedule of individuals coming in and, and getting monitoring plain film. So John, uh, help us understand there's obvious pros and cons to different ways of doing this. But when you're thinking about a study here that that's relying on patients coming in with, with would be a clinical fracture as opposed to potentially identifying a bunch of silent fractures that could have been found on monitoring. How, how do you think about this? What are the pros and cons of those different approaches? So as you said, that's exactly what it is. If you don't look for a fracture, you may not find it. And those are typically the silent fractures that are vertebral fractures. It's estimated that about 60% of vertebral fractures do not come to clinical attention. We call them clinically silent, and they're only recognized radiographically if you actually look for them or you're doing uh, imaging for uh, other reasons. And this is important because vertebral compression fractures are one of the most common fragility fractures, and they confer one of the highest risk for future fractures in individuals with prevalent vertebral fractures. The decision not to include them is typically in uh, research studies when you don't do something prospectively is related to cost and practicality. It may have not been practical to obtain additional x-rays, especially that if you're going to obtain spinal films and you do detect a vertebral fracture, it may need clinical correlation for you to call it fragility fracture or not. And this capacity to do that in this research study may have not been available, in addition to the cost that it incurs. That being said, the study, as you said, did perform DEXA for bone density. And performing a vertebral fracture assessment or VFA at the time of the DEXA is a very efficient way and low cost, low radiation way to do it when you're obtaining DEXA for other reasons. We're going to wrap up the method section here with a few thoughts on the statistical analysis and how the authors did that. Uh, and we'll talk about it just a little bit. And I, and I really like the way that the authors approached it. And I think more importantly, how they showed the data. And that's what I'm all going to get to in a second here. But the way that they did this is with some serial adjustments. And, and the idea, uh, again, and with observational studies of why you would do adjustments is that's because you're worried about confounders. We talk about confounders a lot. So just as a really brief reminder, a confounder is something, is something clinical that is related to what you have labeled and, and are studying as an exposure. And it's connected to that, but it's actually what's driving the outcome or is having a, a meaningful impact on that. And if you don't recognize that and account for that, then because that confounder is connected, is associated to the exposure, you can mistakenly attribute the outcome to what you have called the exposure. This is a common issue in virtually any observational study that you do. And, and you always have to think about that. And the authors do a good job of that here. And, and the way that they do that is they make adjustments. So this is a very typical way of doing this. It's a statistical adjustment. You are able to assess the impacts of these confounders, and then you're able to remove that impact in your final analysis. And the authors did this with a series of adjustments. Initially, they started with just the crude, so they didn't make any adjustments just to see what it was before you started accounting for these confounders. Then at the, the first level, the first pass, they adjusted for age, height, and weight. Then on the second one, they did those other clinical risk factors. And then after that, it was the femoral neck, bone mineral density. Then the next one was falls. And I think those are the really important ones there. There was a final one to where they adjusted for death as a competing event, which is a bit of a technical thing that they did there and a little bit different than thinking about these other confounders. 
Uh, they looked at a few other things. So we talked about some of the labs that were done. They looked at GFR, albumin, and then previous treatment to see if those functioned as confounders. And then they discovered that they didn't. And so then they didn't need to add them into these adjustments. And, and just to wrap up with that, I'll say I really, really like this because not only do they do this with these series, but they show you those results in, in the results section. And why that's so helpful is that helps a reader gauge how likely it is that there is some residual confounding. You get really worried is, is if the authors find a difference and then as they start introducing these adjustments for confounders, the difference between the two groups or the, the groups, the multiple groups really shrinks down to a small amount. If you see a big movement with adjustment for confounders, you then get worried that any residual confounding, things that the authors forgot to measure or just couldn't measure very well, that if you had been able to account for that, that then maybe the difference goes to nothing or close enough to it to where you, you wouldn't get that excited about it. And this really helps you see that. So that lets you see as they are adjusting for these, how much is that moving the relative risk or the odds ratio or whatever it's used here and gives a reader valuable information. I always hate it when we, when they authors make these adjustments, but then don't show you what the impact is here. So, so editorial comment there, but just to say really liked how the authors approach to this. And I think as the reader is, it empowers you to understand a little bit more of the impact here. Okay, so that's the uh, brief word on the statistics here and the methodology. We're going to turn things over to Amal now, and she's going to walk through. There's a lot of data here, so she's got a lot of work to parse that out and uh, present it in a good, understandable way. But we will uh, send things over to her now. Indeed, there are a lot of data here, and we have made uh, an executive decision to focus on the most important outcomes, most important findings. So the discussion of the results may not 100% parallel every single number and piece of information in the tables. So as Chase mentioned, there were 3,028 women aged 75 to 80 who were initially included in the study cohort. However, only 2,778 women, and that's 91.7% of the initial cohort, had complete data on hemoglobin, clinical risk factors, and femoral neck BMD. So only this group was included in the analyses that I will be citing next. The mean hemoglobin concentration in the group was 13.5 grams per deciliter. Among these women, 185 had anemia, and that was defined by a hemoglobin cutoff of 12. So if their hemoglobin was less than 12, they were placed in the group that had anemia. Let's look at table one. It provides the baseline characteristics of the cohort as a whole, and it also divides the cohort into the subjects with anemia and the subjects without anemia and compares the baseline characteristics between these two, two groups. So if we try to look together at table one, we will see that the anemia and no anemia groups were not fully identical regarding their baseline characteristics. And without going into every single detail there, you will notice that there were statistically significant differences between these two groups on some of those characteristics. I will come back to highlight the importance of this in a little bit. As part of the baseline characteristic assessment, the investigators calculated the FRAX probabilities for every participant with and without including femoral neck bone mineral density. And that's also in table one. When the BMD information was not included in the FRAX calculation, there was no statistical difference in the 10-year probability of hip and of major osteoporotic fracture between the anemia and no anemia groups. However, when they put the femoral neck bone density in the FRAX calculation, patients with anemia had a higher probability of major osteoporotic fracture and of hip fracture compared to those without anemia. That doesn't yet mean that anemia is necessarily the cause for these fractures. As Chase mentioned, it could be another confounder that is connected both with anemia and with fracture that is making it look that there is a relationship. For example, the patients with anemia had higher prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis. And rheumatoid arthritis in and out of itself is a risk factor that is included in the FRAX calculation. So when we see an association between anemia and the probability of fracture as predicted by FRAX, at this point, we don't know whether this is truly the anemia 
explaining that correlation or whether the rheumatoid arthritis, which is related to both the anemia and the FRAX estimates, is the confounder here that's making things look the way they are. So things will become a little bit clearer as we continue to go through the analyses. Next, we will review the correlations between hemoglobin and incident fractures. This is one of the primary aims of this study, is to look at a relationship between hemoglobin levels and fracture incidence. Those results are presented in Table 3. The median follow-up for this cohort was 6.7 years, and during the, this time, there were 734 fractures, what the authors call any fractures. 148 fractures were hip fractures, and 601 were major osteoporotic fractures. The investigators ran some predictive models, as Chase just described, using those logistic analysis models and including confounders you know, at different steps of building that model. But they built predictive models using anemia as a categorical value. So you either have anemia or you don't have anemia. So it's a yes or no. Remember, using a cutoff hemoglobin of 12. But they also used hemoglobin in and out of itself as a continuous variable. So regardless of whether or not you have anemia, they ran some correlations using hemoglobin as a continuous variable. All these analyses were adjusted for age, height, weight, the FRAX clinical risk factors, and the femoral neck BMD, as Chase pointed out, in a sequential mode. The, the different uh, confounders were added gradually to the model. So at the end, they found that both anemia as a categorical variable and decreasing hemoglobin both correlated with higher risks of hip fracture, major osteoporotic fracture, and any fracture. And so at this point, I just want you to try to hold the concept of this statistical model in your head is that they built a model that predicted the risk of all of these different fractures with anemia or hemoglobin as the main predictor. And they corrected for different confounders, including age, weight, height, sex. I mean, they're all women here, BMD and FRAX, because I'm going to come back to this model and demonstrate how they used it later. So from here, they set out to answer another primary question, which is whether adding the hemoglobin to the FRAX calculation will improve the predictive ability of the FRAX calculator. To do this, they considered a hypothetical 75-year-old woman with a BMI of 26 and none of the traditional uh, FRAX risk factors. So this woman did not have rheumatoid arthritis, did not use glucocorticoids, did not smoke, did not drink excessively, etc. And for these calculations, they did not include the femoral neck bone mineral density, which as a reminder, may or may not be included in FRAX. We have both options there. Using the predictive model that they just formulated earlier, they estimated the fracture risk of this patient at different levels of hemoglobin, ranging between the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile. So for different levels, they calculated what this patient's risk of fracture would be. To make it easier to understand, if you have the article in front of you, I would suggest you move to figure 2A, where they show that work. On figure 2A, the dotted line represents that patient's 10-year risk of major osteoporotic probability using the traditional FRAX that does not incorporate hemoglobin. And you will see that the dotted line is basically a flat line, a straight horizontal line, because it's not going to change with hemoglobin because hemoglobin does not play a role in that. Now, the solid line shows the fracture probabilities that they found when they introduced different levels of hemoglobin into their calculations. And you will see that when the patient had a hemoglobin at the 10th percentile, her probability of fracture was around 25.9%. But when she had a hemoglobin at the 90th percentile, her fracture probability was around 14.8%. So now we are not predicting a flat line. This flat line is moving sort of in an inverse fashion with hemoglobin. With lower hemoglobin, we have higher fracture probability. With higher hemoglobin, we have a lower fracture probability. When they compared the black line to the dotted line, they found that adding hemoglobin to the FRAX model will increase the fracture probability by 20% when the subject's hemoglobin is at the 10th percentile and will lower it by about 30% when the subject's hemoglobin is at the 90th percentile. 
So basically, this analysis suggests that the current FRAX model underestimates fracture probability for patients who have a low hemoglobin, and it overestimates fracture probability for a patient who has a high hemoglobin. And to confirm these findings, they repeated the same estimates, the same model, using a woman who is 80 years old now, but otherwise using the same conditions to do their calculations. If you look at figure 2b, that will show you the estimates for both hypothetical patients, the 75-year-old and the 80-year-old. So you might recall that they also had a secondary aim in the study, which is to examine the correlations between hemoglobin and bone density and microstructure parameters derived from DEXA and from the HRPQCT. The investigators performed these analyses in two different ways. First, by correlating these bone parameters with the presence or absence of anemia. So again, is your hemoglobin below 12 or is it above 12? They also did the same correlations using the hemoglobin as a continuous variable. Looking at the DEXA parameter, there was no correlation with hemoglobin when used as a continuous variable, but they did find a negative correlation between presence of anemia and BMD at the femoral neck and at the total hip. This means that subject with a hemoglobin of less than 12 had lower bone density at those sites compared to subjects with a hemoglobin above 12. Again, these analyses were adjusted for age, weight, and height. Now, looking at these same types of correlations, but with HRPQCT now, if you go to table two, you will see all the different parameters that were extracted from the HRPQCT and all the different correlations they did. For the sake of time, I will not review every individual parameter in isolation, but you will see that both the presence of anemia as a categorical variable and lower hemoglobin as a continuous variable predicted less favorable cortical bone parameters, such as decreased volumetric cortical bone density and increased cortical bone porosity. Again, these analyses were adjusted for age, weight, and height. All right, I know it's a lot of data and a lot of analyses, and I will circle back to Chase to help us put it together in a coherent way. All right, well, we're going to try them all. That was a great job, a lot of data, and I think very nicely presented there to, to give us a good understanding of that. Yeah, so we, we are going to wrestle with the conclusions here like we normally do, and we're, and we're going to start with what the authors say and then some of the connections they make to, to other aspects of the medical literature, and John's going to help us again to, to try to see if, if this makes sense, if, if the explanations that the authors are giving here really fit with what we know about bone physiology. So to start with the author's conclusion, so they say that among this cohort of older Swedish women, the risk of incident fractures increases with both the prevalence of anemia and decreasing levels of hemoglobin, and that's independent of fracture clinical risk factors and the femoral neck bone mineral density. The authors point out, just like Amol ended, that anemia and low hemoglobin were associated with lower bone mineral density at the femoral neck and total hip with lower cortical volumetric bone mineral density and higher porosity of the tibia, suggesting an impact on cortical bone. So more on that in just a second. The authors point out that their data indicates that hemoglobin functions as a continuous variable and not with an anemia cutoff. And I think that, that that is exactly what you would expect. You would actually be really worried is if you got all the information you were going to get by just saying, did the patient have anemia, yes or no, using that cutoff of 12 Almost always with factors like this, if something is bad for you and whether that's directly causative or whether it's merely a marker, then generally speaking, if it's bad for you, the more of it that you've got, the worse it should be. If merely a presence, yes or no, makes a big difference for something that is a continuous variable, and then, then you do wonder if we've really assessed it the right way. So uh, this makes sense physiologically, and I think is reassuring to see this. And the authors try to put together a mechanism to explain, well, why is this happening? Uh, Amal has pointed out already, as we still at least have to wonder, is could this just be from confounders? And as I say, as an aside, since this is really helping us understand whether somebody is at a high risk or not, purely from that perspective, it maybe doesn't make a big difference if this is mediated through a confounder or whether this is truly the anemia itself that's driving it. It's helping you understand how likely somebody is to break a bone. However, the authors try to put together here an explanation for how this could actually be causative. 
And what they say is this association between hemoglobin level and cortical bone in particular, as opposed to trabecular bone, could indicate that cortical bone is more dependent on hemoglobin levels for a sufficient oxygen supply. All right, John, help us. Uh, this is a hypothesis that is not the main point of what the authors are trying to do here, but they do want to explain this connection. You think about this stuff a lot. What are your thoughts on this? Make sense? Does this fit with what we know with physiology? Not particularly. Help us understand that more. Uh, first of all, this is in line of what was seen before. So a handful of other studies in other population outside of Sweden also looked at the relationship between hemoglobin and different compartments of bone using HRPQCT. And it's consistent with mostly a cortical bone-driven decrease in bone density, both the volumetric and the cortical porosity, as Amal mentioned earlier. But we don't have enough information to try to explain these observations that's been seen across multiple studies and validated in this study. The authors here suggested that there is more vascularization happening in the uh, trabecular bone, which is a fact. And the fact that you have more vascularization happening, the trabecular bone is not dependent on hemoglobin for oxygen delivery or less dependent because there is so much blood supply coming in, as opposed to the cortical bone, which does not have enough blood blood supply or less blood supply can be easily impacted by changes in hemoglobin and the resultant hypoxia. The hypothesis makes sense, but it is a hypothesis at the end of the day. We do not have any data to back that up, but it is certainly making sense in terms of physiologic background. Good. Sure, that's helpful. And at the very end, we'll, we'll come back to that and, and say, well, do we need to understand that more before we can move on this? So, so we'll sit tight on that and come back to that at the very end. The authors then go on to make a few other statements, and I would label these as proposed implications of their results. They don't phrase it quite that way, but I think it would be a fair way of saying it. So a few things that they say. First of all, they suggest that hemoglobin should be considered as an additional risk factor for, for fractures. And they, they do say, though, that additional studies are going to be needed to determine how to incorporate that into that 10-year fracture estimate. So we're not quite ready to, to change the FRAX calculator, at least according to the authors. Authors. We need more data. Uh, we, we already heard uh, before from Amal and Jod about how there's this is country specific data. And so you have to get a lot of information. It takes a lot of work to update this, but potentially that, that's where we're going. And then finally, the authors point out, helpfully, I think that hemoglobin measurement requires few resources and is actually often already available when you're seeing a patient. Uh, often they're, they're coming with the information that you would need to plug in a hemoglobin if you were able to do so. So it would be a relatively affordable addition to that if it's already information that you have. The authors then go on to point out a few strengths of their study. They point out, first of all, that they have a large cohort. And then the, the next two things that they point out, I, I would say, are related to their study design. So that they say they were able to extensively characterize their participants and also that they had high quality fracture outcome data. And I think a big part of this, there's several reasons for that, but a big part of that is because this was a prospective study and because the authors were able to define exactly what information they want to make sure that they get up front. There's a big downsides to prospective study in clinical research. Time is money. Anything that, that takes years to complete is usually going to be expensive. But this is one of the reasons for doing it is you can say, this is what we want. And this is the information we're going to make sure that we get. So, so I agree with them on that. As far as study limitations, the authors point out that both the hemoglobin and the bone mineral density was measured only at baseline. And as is often the case in these studies, there was some missing or inadequate data. So to wrap things up for what the authors say, they give us a, a couple of summary statements in conclusion, which I'll quote here. The first one, anemia and decreasing levels of hemoglobin are associated with lower bone mineral density, worse cortical bone traits, and incident fracture, independently of FRAX clinical risk factors and bone mineral density in older women. And then their other summary statement, considering hemoglobin levels may improve the clinical evaluation of patients with osteoporosis and assessment of fracture risk. So Amal, let's start with you. And we'll get to in a second whether this needs to change our practice, how it needs to be affecting things. But I'm interested, just your thoughts about this report overall. Uh, obviously, we, we talked about the intrinsic limitations of observational studies. So, so how do the authors do? What, what do you think about this report in general? I think as far as epidemiologic studies, it's a very well-designed study. Nonetheless, we have to consider it within the context of how this study was ran, right? We're talking about a specific area in a specific country with women who are between the ages of 75 and 80. 
from a validity point of view, it's a very circumscribed study. You know, it's a, you know, the parameters are quite limited. Not to say that it doesn't carry validity, but we have to think much more carefully if, as we think about it as general practitioners of osteoporosis care or endocrinology, how we apply that to the general group of patients. Yeah, same question for you. Just thoughts in general about the quality of this report. I agree with what uh, Amal said, but a couple of points that I came across when I was reviewing this. First of all, one of the strengths of the study, I thought, is the choice of age. Data and older women, this is the highest risk group, right? Older women have the highest absolute risk for fracture. So I'm glad to see that we're recruiting patients in older age groups, even within the postmenopausal age group uh, going older. I think HRPQCT data is very, very strong point in this study. But going back to the association between anemia and bone density and fracture, we need to think of anemia as acute versus chronic. Here we're going back to our internal medicine. And hemoglobin, when it is checked only at one point in time, does not tell you an entire story. And obviously, what we, when we're looking at a chronic condition such as osteoporosis, we are looking at chronic anemia uh, rather than acute anemia in relation to that. And a single value of hemoglobin may not tell you the entire picture there, rather than looking at an average of hemoglobins, even though, like you said, this is widely available. You're going to see every patient with a hemoglobin at some point. You want to take the clinical picture uh, into consideration as well. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. The authors did point out the, the limitation with the hemoglobin only being measured at baseline. And I think that's a great explanation of, of why that is, in fact, a limitation as far as how to understand this and how we might apply these results ourselves. All right, uh, Jod, let, let's stick with you and then have you wrap things up for us. So help us think about, we always like to end these studies with, should this change our clinical practice? We talked about the FRAX calculator already. So this is the, the, the folks at the University of Sheffield put this together. So this is not something that we can go in and edit. So if this is ever going to be a part of that calculator, we've got to wait till they make some changes there. So can't immediately make adjustments there. But as, as you think about this and, and as these folks are wrestling with this and you do a lot of work in this field, you think about this a lot. Do you think this is ready to go soon? What, what all is going to have to go into this to understand that? And that's just from a purely clinical perspective. You mentioned before, we don't really know enough about the underlying pathophys as it relates to anemia. So are we going to be so hesitant when we don't understand that, that we actually also need more basic science and or translational data to understand what's driving this? So just how, how do we think about this? What, what are we waiting for? How soon do we think this might be something that we're actually using to affect our patient care? So I'm going to go back to many points that Amal mentioned earlier, that uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done before this is a part of our routine clinical uh, evaluation in someone with the risk of fracture. At the end of the day, when we look at a patient, we look at the patient as a whole. Do they have a low, a moderate, or a high risk of fracture? And we use the FRAX as a tool. We use the bone density as a tool. But many things are missed and are not included. Falls, sarcopenia, frailty, these are chronic conditions, geriatric syndromes that also happen with osteoporosis. And these are a higher priority for us in evaluating a patient in the clinic to discuss their risk of future fracture. Hemoglobin, we're going to see it uh, in, in every patient, as I said. And it would be a thought-provoking issue to bring up chronic anemia as something that increased the risk of that patient, whether it's increasing the risk of fall or uh, through other mechanisms, that it does increase the risk of fracture when we're looking at the patient as a whole. Will it make it to FRAX at some point? It may. It took almost two decades to update the FRAX into now the beta version of the FRAX Plus that's out there. And it included some additional variables that were not accounted for previously and that are quite useful in clinical practice. But there is much more work that needs to be done before this is part of our day-to-day -day evaluation. And one point that I also wanted to make is we talked about country-specific data, and this is done in Sweden in a Swedish population. We need, really need to remember populations where you have a high prevalence of hemoglobinopathies, such as thalassemia and sickle cell disease. And uh, how does that impact this evaluation and this? what are the other confounders that we need to account for when looking at this association? And these may not have been quite, they were not excluded from this population, but this could be simply because they are not very prevalent in Sweden. But this becomes important when you're looking at other population as well. And with that, I would like to thank Amal Shibli Rahal and John Safir for joining me for this month's edition of Intercom Feedback Loop. I hope that you all learned as much as I did and that you will join us again next month.
And now you're in the loop. This has been Endocrine Feedback Loop. Endocrine Feedback Loop is brought to you as a members only benefit of the Endocrine Society with production oversight by Brandy Brown and Andrew Harmon.